the one text you know this is um a really a bit of an overview of, of where I'm up to in my uh, doctoral career. Um particularly looking at um so I'm looking at institutional policies and how they interact with people's education practices. Um in particular about how my disease about scoring so my study is called um, Valuing Open, and it's kind of about um, what, are, what are the values that we ascribe to openness in education in the group um, through different kinds of policies. And this really is thinking about policy in quite a wide sense. Um, so not necessarily just thinking about um, institutions that have an open education policy or have an OER policy, but um, so much as what are the policies that you have? What are they doing in this open education space? Um, that means looking at policy texts, um, so actual written policies as, as they exist, researching community perspectives, which is what I've been doing through the um, survey, um, which I launched at the previous OER conference a um, year ago. And, um, so it's great to be back here and report, report back um, this year. Um, and then the next stage that I'm going to get to is um, patient being involved in making the process of institution. And so the, the research questions that I'm considering are about the relationship between the policies and practices, um, and that's sort of through all the different strands. Um, thinking about what the key drivers of um, policies are according to policymakers and stakeholders, um, and that's partly through the survey. To the extent, um, and also, um, what are the characteristics and similarities of these policies and are these policy drivers or trends being altered or accelerated in the context of the pandemic? Because obviously the pandemic that came along um, as a big interrupter of my research and um, it stopped me from actually doing any quite quite a while. And um, and then um, that got me thinking about how I'll really be researching anything in this higher education context with that going on and not kind of acknowledge that's been going on, that's changing a lot of stuff, it's, um, it's, it's having an impact on what is to do So, uh, so thinking about policy levels, you have a, a supranational level, where we have uh, organizations that, that, that make uh, declarations, recommendations, um, UNESCO most famously, um, encouraging member states to think about these things in certain ways, to take certain kinds of actions. The government le level, um, they're able to make legislation and make available funding for different kinds of, um, of, of the policy initiatives like um, OER, for example. And then in the institutional level, it's, there's so many different things that we consider actually to be making up the policy of the institution, the kind of policy landscape. So there are strategies, um, things that are actually officially called policies, there are manuals, guidelines, there's advice, there's funding that's put towards certain kinds of initiatives. As far as I can tell, that, that's a policy decision, even if it's not written or a document as being a piece of policy. Um, it's also when you have in your organization people who actually know about certain kinds of practices, people who can support you with different things, the decision to employ people like that, again, is a policy decision in the same way as funding a, funding a project. Um, and also providing the infrastructure that makes some kinds of practices possible and others um, others maybe are not possible with that infrastructure. So think about the classic um, kind of online learning environments that we have in institutions. Normally these are not very good at enabling open education practice. So normally it's all kind of logging and you've got your courses that you're studying and not access to anything that you're not personally studying and that kind of thing. And certainly for the external to organization this is all kind of Falls Garden or whatever, I just call it. Um, and also, um, I started thinking about uh, policy as also being um, just kind of the way that we do things, courses of action. So it's basically policy is kind of enacted in, in practice to some kind of extent. Um, and I don't really think policy, how um, actually use this phrase, courses of action, in one of her um, presentations that I've got the intersection of my kind of describing what. What could also be a, a form of policy? But thanks. And, um, and you know, also, when you say something like it's not our policy to do something, that's that's just things we've done. Right. So, 
So as you can see, quite an ex expansive concept of policy. Um, it mean, makes the, this space interesting to think about, but also complicated. Um, so we uh, kind of talked a bit about all these different types of policy, and I'm also, and, and of course I'm thinking about what policies are doing. Um, it may be labeling, constraining, recognizing, legitimizing, testing, all of these types of practices. So again, I'm not focused only on, on OER, but also on the online courses, maybe um, connections that you might um, now be able to get by doing um, what were formerly seen as just kind of free online courses. Um, network participatory learning communities, um, student knowledge production and sharing, um, crowdsourced collaborative knowledge production, um, for example, you know, the Wikiverse, and, um, and also thinking about the culture of the in, in, um, in institutions and whether that's present to what extent and how it manifests. And so, um, so for the, the kind of second strand, which is not looking at policies and not yet interviewing the policymakers, but surveying um, open, essentially open practitioners, people, people who may or may not regard themselves as that, but who are at least interested enough to answer a survey. Um, <laughs> about it, um, then um, yeah, I've done the I've done the survey, and I, I, my aim really was to reach people that have an interest and a, and a knowledge about what feel that they felt they had a knowledge of what's going on in their institution. Um, so this is kind of purposive sampling. It's not supposed to be seen as a representative sample because how could you possibly have a representative sample? I think in this kind of um, um, it, it, so in that in that sense, if I wanted, if I you know, a representative sample is not what you would want when you were doing some kind of polling when you're trying to find out kind of um, you know, what's the public opinion. But this was more about the opinion of this kind of action group who may take an interest in each topic. Um, and so, uh, so through this, I'm hoping to point to trends and illuminate areas where you know less about. And, um, and uh, this, in the survey, I've been asking across a range uh, questions across a range of areas of open practice that I kind of showed on the previous slide. Um, and then, and then, so I was asking about the different areas, the methods of supporting them, um, and participants were asked to rate the level of support that their institution provides on those different kinds of practices and, and, and practices. And they were also asked to elaborate and explain um, ad links or you know, just tell me tell me more um, in three text boxes kind of you know, in relation to every area of practice. And so this generated um, a huge amount of I can't tell you very much of it today. <laughs> um, um, I was really pleased with the number of responses that I got, which was 202. Um, and um, yeah, um, majority female, but good count of men. Um, and a um, wide range of roles, but mostly um, academic uh, teaching and or um, teaching and research or you know, academic roles, um, but quite a few from Education development, design, and technologies as well. It's a substantial group of um, five minutes. And this was an, an international survey that was spoken to, open to, to all. Um, obviously, there are going to be limitations in who would actually answer a survey that's in the first place in English, and that is going out to people that um, that I am able to reach from my position of, you know, I'm a PhD student, I don't have any kind of you know, magical way of putting this survey in front of people that don't know me and don't have any kind of um, ties, some, you know, really weak way to. So it was challenging to get the survey out, and I'm really pleased with the, um, through the various kinds of tactics that I tried, including um, kind of social media, email, um, presenting at various kinds of events, things like that. <laughs> and also contacting some people in the field to write to them, but please tell me to answer my survey. Then I was able to get, get responses from quite a, um, a wide range of countries. Um, interestingly, the biggest responding country, Canada, um, uh, but that is in the largest number of responses, it's probably also the biggest country. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the most responses from Canada, um, quite a lot from the UK, um, quite a few from the US, and then um, uh, South Africa, and quite, quite a few um, European countries had a, a few responses, and as well as Brazil. And then most of the other countries were like one response per country. 
So, um, but, you know, I mean, I work my organization stops a response from that. Um, I also asked people about what was their experience of education, just to see if my anticipation of the kinds of people who would be interested in answering the survey was um, was accurate. And so um, there were um, people who said, described themselves as an experienced practitioner and a visible advocate, so like the biggest um, biggest group in the you know people who said I'm an experienced practitioner advocate with a role in developing policy was also a big group that was forty. Um, people, perhaps 73, who didn't feel they had a role in policy, and um, 43 people who said, I am a, um, a best practitioner, and 45 said, I just more recently started learning. So that was kind of kind of what I was expecting, was interesting to see that. Um, so, um, so the next bit I'm going to talk about, kind of some findings that I, that I found out in the um, section of the survey that was about how we are. Um, and um, what I asked was this. Um, so the use of creation, sharing, and adaptation of open educational resources, for example, open textbooks at your institution. Then I asked them across these different areas, is it discussed in um, one or more explicit written policies? Is it supported by funding for initiatives or projects? Um, is it supported through infrastructure? Um, is it supported by staff members with relevant expertise? Um, and is it supported by forms of recognition or reward for participants? Um, and I asked the same, basically the same set of questions for the other kind of forms of open practice as well. And, um, and what I found was that OER is um, discussed in um, written policies um, on the on the scale. It was it, it, the scale was probably like sort of unsupported through to highly supported. Um, so these. Um, Respondents felt it was highly supported in a, a reasonably good number of cases, um, sort of nearly nearly forty, and although completely unsupported in slightly more than forty, um, and then um, kind of a range in between. So there's actually potentially there's kind of actually more written policy out there than I would necessarily have. It, and I asked them if it's supported by funding for initiatives and projects. There, it was, um, you know, by far the biggest response was unsupported. But when you look at the kind of um, adding together the somewhat and highly, that there was, you know, definitely there's, there's some of that. Um, in terms of staff members with relevant expertise, I was kind of pleased to say that the highly supported came out. Um, strongly and somewhat supportive as well. Uh, so, um, so you know, that was part of the people do seem to know that there are people in their organization that know about this. Right, obviously not in all cases, but in... So in terms of whether um, OER was supported by infrastructure, um, platforms or tools, um, this so one was to be some unsupported by this highly supported. So here we have really a mix across all the, the all the levels. Um, not that um, highly supported, obviously, but um, forty six was the most. But not it's not like radically out in front of and much less supported. Um, and here I thought I wasn't surprised, and I was. Um, Pointing a bit, I guess, um, in terms of whether it's supported by forms of recognition or reward for participating staff, um, sort of absolutely unsupported by one of the biggest um, maybe three um, responses. So, so all of those numbers are like sort of interesting, but what does it mean? And I think we can get a lot more of a flavor of what it means by reading some of the text comments from this. This, uh, this uh, topic about OER had a lot, um, and some of the comments were really good. Um, so uh, we have uh, creation and adaptation grants, we have a dedicated policy and service employee staff, um, it's explicitly in our strategic plan, grant program tools, staff member, we recognize people who are doing this on our website. Um, we have an OER librarian now, um, and um, library runs an OER publishing house, there's a written policy that advocates for use of OER, 
you know, pockets of noisy take, taking place and trying to bring these academics together. There were a lot of like um, encouraging um, uh, messages coming through there. But that was not by, by no means all of the responses were like this. Um, and I don't want to call these the bad, but they were definitely not so. So um, we, we have a library based initiative, it's poorly funded and not well promoted. Um, I was well supported by the library, but through informal channels, I'm not supported by my dean. The OER will do nothing for my profile. The library is actively engaged with the wider institution. If not, um, that was not an unusual. I think there were various comments that were along these type of lines. Um, positive quality statements, but very little real progress. Um, I'm an adjunct. I have no idea if this institution cares about OER, and it isn't worth my time to figure it out so long as no one tries to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, admirable. Um, determination, but you know, kind of not not sounding like someone is feeling empowered by their institution. Yeah. Um, and then you know, it got uglier than this. So um, I don't think they even know what OER is, other than it's free. If so, why do we want to share things for free? Um, we've had projects, and some of these are permanent parts, but open as an ideal was officially spoken against in committees around that time, and traction was not really gained. Um, there was a role in the library which supported open practice, but funding disappeared. Open ed supported off the size of very few people's desks, and by some faculty working in isolation. I was like, hmm, interesting. That's cool. Um, <laughs> so there's some practice, but senior management are uninterested, disengaged, and not informed. Um, and open educational policy seems to be entirely anathema to the workings of the university. <laughs> So, um, so you know, there, there was some, the free text comments were where, where really it, were bringing the people's views to life. I felt <laughs> quite a bit of it. Um, and there are so many, so many people. Um, I should come and see future talks. <laughs> um, I also asked them, um, what's going on with copyright in your institution? Um, and um, and so. Um, this was really useful to run the survey by the GoVN group pilot. Um, and thanks to Kathy, actually, she pointed out that I had not included a useful option in this question, which I then added. So, um, so I was thinking the institution owns the copyright, um, the institution um, generally owns the copyright, but they exempt research, seems to be another model, um, or if employees own their own copyright. And then, um, Kathy said it can also depend on what type of problem you have. So, if you're an academic, maybe you don't know what you if you were you know, staff, as they tend to say, um, non academic staff, professional services staff, as you probably say, and, and, and your the institution owns your IP. <laughs> and, um, and of course, I also thought this might well be unclear or unknown to many people, and it was. So, um, unclear or unknown was uh, um, about 20%. Um, the copyright ownership depends on the type of role that I hadn't even thought to ask, actually came out to about 16%. Um, if boys own the copyright um, in their own works, for whatever purpose it's produced, about 23%. Institution generally owns everything, but research is exempted, about 20%. Institution owns all everything, um, about 21%. So it's a quite a big mix. So we can see that uh, quite often when we're advocating for the kinds of practices that we might wish to advocate for in this space, it's not actually obvious um, what position people are in in terms of whether they even own their own material. Um, and um, and I, I think also it's not obvious whether if the institution owns the material, what they want you to do with it or don't want you to do with it either. Right. So you A, you don't know if they own it or you own it. <laughs> And then B, you don't know what they're okay with or they're not. And so I asked them, so ownership status aside, what's what how do how do you think that the institution feels? Um, are you encouraged to consider licensing and releasing these as OER? Um, about 38% said yes, neither encouraged nor discouraged, about 56%, uh, and we're discouraged from releasing these, um, about 60%. Mm -hmm. Just moralizing, but at least it was that. So another thing that I thought would be interesting to um, to mention um, for this session was about the kind of pandemic effects. Um, and um, Brina, who is here with me, um, knows that um, I was um, very interested in what was going on during the pandemic around um, the um, ballooning cost of library resources. 
Um, and in the UK, there's been a really prominent campaign known as ebook SOS around this. Um, they use the ebook SOS hashtag on Twitter, and they continue to be an active community that's sort of arguing against the exorbitant costs of, um, of the, the textbooks, um, which basically were the costs were enormously ramped up during the pandemic. And um, institutions like where I work ended up investing um, un, unanticipated, unplanned millions of extra pounds into library resources in order to support students who weren't able to get to the library. And, um, and that's an institution that's lucky enough to be able to find that money that you can, which is not. So, um, and then um, uh, Rain and I also wrote an article about kind of our experiences of digital education support people in the context of the pandemic and how a lot of people were saying now is the time for openness, but was it was it really happening or not? Um, and so that's um, that might be of interest. Anyway, so what did I find from the survey, which um, which I asked, you know, what, what was being the impact in terms of um, education policy or practice? Um, very mixed bag. Um, not sure it made much difference. Our institutional response was much more tool focused, um, with a little offered about the potential where we are open pedagogy in the field. That's quite that's quite a common um, situation. Um, I don't believe it's impacted formal policy, but then definitely increased awareness of open resources and practices. Um, a positive shift was OEP, not policy as such, but the teaching and learning community overall. This was essentially what Green and I put it up in our felt that people have opened up to the idea of actually discussing teaching, how do they teach, why do they do the things that they do in a way that they were not doing as much. That, that was a definitely, definitely an increase in open practice, even if people were not so increasing the, their adoption or adoption of open resources. And um, an interest in OER was a byproduct of the difficulties of providing access to the commercial education materials that were previously assigned. So I think, you know, there's maybe that's a slow burn at that thing because I think this thing of um, shifting gears as an institution and saying, okay, we're going to start creating OER, knowing how this is happening at my institution as well, it's, it's quite a long process to sort of get those things into production and seeing, seeing that happen. So, uh, but, so some sense that there, there is some progress. So, um, so I'm not going to talk about all of the other stuff that I've asked about in the survey. There's loads more questions and loads more responses. And again, you know, really from the heart, kind of um, fascinating pretext comments, which is going to still be and, um, <laughs> somewhat of a pleasure to analyze. <laughs> um, but um, but it's, um, it's proving to, to be, you know, quite an interesting um, study that I'm looking forward to. Reporting more about. Um, so next, I will continue my analysis of the survey data. I will recruit and interview policymakers. Um, I will analyze the interviews, pull it all together, and then I just have to write the book. <laughs> um, and so, thanks very much for listening to this. Um, thanks for updates. Um, references to this presentation. I'll tweet the link. Um, and Almost five minutes, so no more questions for me. I'm starting those if there's any questions first. Was there anything in the five minutes that surprised you most? And what was that? That's a really, um, a really good question. I think actually what surprised me um, at first, because I was I was kind of reading all the responses as they came in, and I was kind of then checking daily, like, do I have any more? And like, you know, and I'm kind of uh, reading through all the all the pretext comments. And um, the, the thing that was the most surprising to me was that it wasn't very surprising. Like, I was like, I felt like, this is kind of what I would think, right? You know, it seems like kind of the, the kind of stuff that people tell me, or the kind of stuff that, that I that I hear from people, or you know, that the, we talk about conferences like this. And um, and so then I started to worry, like maybe this is a really 
um, bad research design. <laughs> oh, I'm not learning anything. Yeah. And, um, and, but, um, but then um, people reassured me that actually it's probably just because I'm so obsessed with this that it's like I'm kind of immersed in all this kind of um, stuff. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Leo. Thank you for sharing the result. I think it's very impressive, especially the response rate. And I think how you shared, like, in terms of like how open education is supported or not supported and by whom at different institutions, I think it really resonates, especially the qualitative statements I can see from the audience. So I think people can really identify with what you're sharing here, which is really good. Uh, perhaps, like, I'm, I'm interested in the next steps, like, because you're planning to interview policymakers within different institutions. Are you going to be drawing from the sample of those institutions that you surveyed, or is this going to be another group of institutional leaders? Because I'm also actually thinking, and I know that this is not part of your you know, objective necessarily, but actually this could turn out to be quite a useful advocacy tool at some point mm -hmm. in time, uh, in terms of how different practitioners and institutions are responding to these sorts of questions, and what the issues are, what the problems are, for example. And it could be used as an advocacy tool in some ways towards institutional leaders to do something about it, mm -hmm. policy support. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, I kind of hope that in the end I'll be able to sort of not only tell kind of the story of what what's happening or you know what does the landscape look like, but also be able to highlight some things that I think are actually working well. Um, kind of some some success stories out of it that other um, other institutions would be interested in um, in emulating or adapting. And, um, and so, for in terms of interviewing the policymakers. Um, I, I think that um, it's going to be tricky because obviously I've got to, got, um, I've got to like track down who's actually going to be interviewed. That's not might be hard, <laughs> but um, but I, I definitely will want to um, try and you know although again as with as as I said even with the with the um, survey sample you know it's not it's not really meant to be representative it's not important to be that with the interviews even less so right but I do want to have as wide a range of possible so I'm going to be thinking about a range of different countries and regions of the world and you know kind of resource rich and resource poor types of environments and all of that kind of thing so so um so I think that you know that, that would be um, my main um goal will be just to try and get and not so much that you know I, I think that the what what I what I will kind of define as being a policymaker will be reasonably flexible because I also think policy is made in quite different ways depending on where you are and um and so some one might be in a position of you know in a very senior position, I just say, well, I wrote the policy and um, people agreed it and then it's done. And um, and some, in some cases, it might have been much more hard than that. And I'd be really fascinated to hear about um, that. That's one question that you asked. Um, we've got probably a few minutes. Maybe if you want to go the question and answer while we set up. Yeah, that's um, good. Just sort of. I'm sort of aware of like there's so much going on and this kind of almost like filter, like you're almost kind of collecting everything and meeting everyone and saying, Yeah, come on, like you get this data and we'll work it out later, sort of thing. I just wonder whether the future you and the present you almost imposing a bit more order onto the chaos. And I sort of get why like, not wanting to do that and not wanting to be too reductive and sort of letting it speak for itself. But my worry is that like it'd be really hard to manage this. Right? And you're probably already thinking about this quite a lot. And are there any sort of like frameworks or stuff that you've been looking at that we see sort of like with analytic tools to start just sort of popping things in boxes, even if that's not really what you want to do, just for the sake of you know, actually completing the project. And just sort of relate to that, you know, I know there's the old Creative Commons policy registry, which I'm not really sure what's happened to that, but have you got any plans to kind of share this data as a database that people could use, maybe, as Eagle said, advocates and people interested in policy, that could be really useful, because you've got such a big detailed data set. And again, it would require that imposition of schema. So I did some work with the, with the um, policy registry, um, people while it was 
while it was still um, operational. And actually, one of the, the, the aspects of the work that we were doing was kind of um, working on the kind of the schema and the way of looking at kind of different types of policy and what are they addressing and kind of sort of like what, what sort of type of, um, you know, whether it's policy or some other kind of instrument that acts in a policy kind of way. Um, and now, and, you know, what these things were, were trying to, what kind of effects they were trying to have. So there, there is some, some work that we've done in terms of kind of classifying policies. Um, and, um, and it definitely will, will kind of go back to that. And the, and the, the policy registry um, data is actually all um, online um, on the Nodo. Um, unfortunately, the site itself is not. But yeah, I will definitely return to that, those kind of uh, schemas and frameworks and, um, and figure out how this maps onto the, the stuff that people have told me. Following up on what Igor was saying then, um, actually while you were presenting here, because I was one of your respondents, and I was benchmarking my institution against the others, mm, this would be very interesting to share with my institution. We're in the bottom 20%, yeah. <laughs> we're in maybe sort of 50% stories there. But um, so that, because I feel like a bit of a money voice, some states and actually see ourselves in that data against other institutions with the price of It could be. I, I don't know. I, I, I worry that also it could make institutions that are not doing a very good job go, well, look, we're normal. <laughs> 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 but, um, but no, I think that there's, there's definitely going to be value in um, kind of re releasing the results in a kind of a um, all that that people can use to make this nice. Well, he's looking into my name. Oh, yes. No, you didn't have to do it. Yes. So, no, this is a funny story. When I looked at the schedules, I thought, oh, I'm opposite Leo. I really don't need past slides. I don't need to worry about it. And then um, got here yesterday during dinner and realized, no, I'm following Leo. Am I legal? So um, <laughs> it's been called F I am Kathy S. Miller, and it's E double S M I double L E R. And I'm the coordinator of Oakland for K State at Oklahoma State University. So we're going to be they are dropped into uh, Twitter and the Discord if you want just to jot it on and then they are not really on site, so we're not missing a whole lot. But um so that that's my gig at Oklahoma State University. I'm also I'm an OER librarian, but I run the open publishing we've got open access to the Spellcom side of the house, and we've intentionally separated them for a number of reasons. Um that's so that's right. So I'm smack dab in the middle of the United States, smack dab in the middle of Oklahoma, uh, coming all the way over here across the pond. You may have noticed a lot of people here from Oklahoma, and the reason is uh, I love this community. I found this group I 2018, maybe Jennifer Edwards appointed me to FEMED Tech, and from FEMED Tech, found my way to GOGN, and from GOGN, found my way to this conference, and love the conversations that uh, y'all are having over here. And I wish I. Uh, I love that our conversations in the states feel like they're shifting more that direction, and so I just scoop up everybody I possibly can and bring them to this to this conference. So Oklahoma is not trying to take over Scotland, but we are really liking it here. So maybe, maybe well, but the topic of my presentation, uh, when we call it, it's just not looking at the screen. You have it here. It's just not good enough. Oh, that are you okay with that? Yeah. Remember, they're not really in slides. Yeah. Are the people on? Yeah. No, no, it's I back in the old days we used to present outside all the time. Um the old days I'm only fifty four, but no, I'm fifty-three. It's not my birthday. It was my birthday at OER last year. Okay, so but my topic today is the I poem, uh, and it's analyzing qualitative data. And I will confess that uh, the expert in this is actually Dr. Bridget. Lavish, and she's my grad student. 
uh, who has been working with us on a, on a grant thing. And of course, I want to scoop her up and get her over here too. Also, uh, I, the way she describes this methodology and this method of data analysis is so wonderful and, and um, gives us something more to do with the qualitative data, right, than just publish it and tell a story or whatever. Uh, and she got a job at Oxford University three weeks ago. So, yay, job happy. Congratulations. Also, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. So, uh, this is what it is. So, I'm going to read from my well written notes so, to give you a good idea of it. Um, but the references in there uh, will really, we have like, okay, so these are the key pieces that have informed uh, this work. So, I'm going to say her name wrong. So, if somebody picks it, Ocean Listen, somebody say it right. Ocean Nielsen. Uh, oh, Eva. Eva, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, yeah, that part I think is like, so Eva, yeah. but um, identifies use of open educational resources as a game changer for novelty, lifelong learning, human rights, and social justice. And that's on page two of that piece. But UNESCO, now I'm nervous, recommendation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, gotcha. You were like, the UNESCO recommendation, I get the recommendation except with the other one, and I got called out last night. The UNESCO recommendation, I'm trying to talk about the 2019 one, uh, oh. for the use of OER, calls for the enactment of significant research. So, uh, one of the conversations over the United States that's being amplified by certain voices is uh, that the research that's being done in areas of open doesn't necessarily oh, me, have the rigor that some feel like it should have in order to be credible. Uh, and I think in this article by Eva, uh, she brings that into play, that calls for the enactment of significant research. So we need to be stepping into that space and we need to be doing research that's considered uh, credible outside of our particular discipline. So in librarianship and fine arts, I also need though to be able to construct a study and enact it and analyze it and show up the results in a way that uh, my chemistry friends are going are gonna to be able to buy into. So we have to be able to speak a lot of different languages. Um, to inform and assess implementation of OER and related practices, uh, selecting effective methods for use in exploring areas of interest is a key part of high quality research. And you'll find that in one of the GOGM pieces that was recently published. It's he's in parentheses there. If I, I talk too fast and I've got a foreign accent, so give me a wave if you start not being able to share. Okay, the presentation uh, author, so Brid Bridget and me, are part of Open Lifelong Learning, uh, and that's a team which has received funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to develop a replicable, replicable research methodology for use in context with little research support, <laughs> such as small rural institutions, community colleges, or for use by faculty and instructors with limited time or research expertise. And this came out of, uh, I think it was a 2019 article uh, by John Hilton uh, that invited us all to do a better job of designing rigorous studies. And in the library community, we talked about it. And I said, hey, I was finished at my PhD. I was like, how many hours of methodology research courses do you take with librarianship? Because over there is a lot of the librarians, right, who are doing the research. And they're like, oh, three. I said, oh, OK. Yeah, so um, we need to, because they're busy learning a lot of other things, right? Information science, that their terminal degree is, it's amazing. But um, so that's our goal is to build out a replicable, rigorous, plug and chug research methodology, right? So uh, it's, it's we, we create a survey uh, and the idea is we'll have a little blurb that says, hey, here's how to build your literature review. Here's a couple key places to start from, make sure, you know, see what's happening right now. This is how to collect the data. This is how to plug it into PSS, sorry. And then here's kind of a way to share your findings. So maybe we can get some replicable results and really see some trends emerge uh, that are designed in a way that cross-disciplinary scholars will be able to buy into. Um, okay, so I left the script for that long thing. Okay, how funny if this is gonna say it again. The research methodology under design aims to measure the impact of OER, OER use on development of lifelong learning skills. So we're stepping away from uh, DFW rates and grades and see if we can, some of those soft skills, workplace skills, critical thinking. Um, and we'll include methods and instruments for the collection and analysis of both quantitative and qualitative data. 
So while quantitative data collection and analysis methods will provide means to assess impact, the team also wanted to provide an avenue through which qualitative data could be used to help explore the ways in which participants made meaning of their experience. The purpose of this presentation is to describe the construction of research poetry, including I poems, used within the project as an analytical method for qualitative data. And, and now here's where we definitely step into Bridget's area of expertise. Uh, so I'll read what she shared with us. Um, so construction of I poems, it's the letter I, I poems, uh, as a method for data analysis is one element of the listening guide, so it's capital L, capital G, qualitative, relational, voice-centered feminist methodology. And citation for that is Woodcock 2016, uh, who really does an in-depth, but it can be used to analyze interview transcripts. The use of poetry as an analytical tool can help distill sometimes unwieldy qualitative data, as you just heard from Luke, uh, down to their bare essence. Constructing qualitative data into I poems can surface voices conventional re research methodologies may silence, according to Woodcock, helping capture counterpoint, harmony, and dissonance. And that's a description by Gilligan uh, in the 2015 in the story. The I poems can also reveal the emotional reverberations and other ineffable, other ineffable components of the qualitative data. So that's a high bar, right? When I, she was first telling me about this, I'm like, that's, uh, that's a lot. But then when you see her work, uh, it's just amazing. And her, she committed her PhD successfully about two weeks ago to apply her dissertation and her lavish 20, 20, whatever it is. Um, so the listening guide, uh, emphasizes attending to the first person voice of the I and its associated stream and listening for the different voices that speak to the researcher's question and tracking the interplay or counterpoint. One of the methods included in this methodology is the construction of I poems. So the overall listening, gu listening guide is the methodology. The I poems is one of the methods within it. Uh, it gives voice to people's silence within conventional research methodologies. Uh, and basically, it involves at least three listeners uh, to the transcript, uh, you know, to the recording. And I think for Bridget, I think she went ahead and created her transcript and followed all of the transcript along as she listened to it. But it wasn't just a read. She really did, uh, she listened all the time uh, to it as well. So on, our, on the first listen, you're just listening for the plot. So like you're going on or you're going for your walk or whatever, and you're just listening and seeing what catches your attention. Uh, on the second listen, according to Bridget, that's where you listen for the I. You listen for each instance in which the narrator refers to themselves using the first person pronoun I, but she also kind of expanded it to we as she did her work. Uh, and then you return to the transcripts from the first listening and you mark and select the groups of I statements that stood out as particularly meaningful or intriguing. So I feel like her second listen has a couple listens in it. Like when she talks about it, like there's the first one where you catch the eyes, and then maybe another one where you go through and decide which eyes really stood out. Um, according to Gilligan and Eddie, there are two rules during the stage of analysis that highlight every I phrase within a given passage, record these phrases in the order of their appearance in the passage. So she had another document over here. First one over here, she highlighted all the I phrases, and um, it makes it, but it's like the I plus the verb. And then she would pull those out and put them in the order of appearance on the document, like the space between them. Uh, and the I phrase includes both the pronoun I and its attached verb. Uh, researchers can, at their discretion, also include any relevant surrounding words. Uh, but the way Bridget enacted it, her first time, she really just did the I plus the verb. And then once she had, I think it was like when she went back to the synthesis stage, she maybe pulled some of the contextual stuff around it, but she really wanted to sit with just the I and the verb and see if it worked, uh, to see what the story was. Uh, then uh, they craft poems from the statements, rewriting the I statements as stanzas. Uh, which attunes her to the voice of the other, and specifically to the I, uh, with the first person voice as it speaks of acting and being in the world. Um, the I poems give a succinct and revealing summary of the narrator's words. And then in the final stage, the researcher synthesizes and then communicates what they, the researcher, has learned about the narrator and their research question. Um, so that really, I, I, that sounds like you're expecting a lot out of qualitative data with a really fuzzy 
method, right? Um, but when she went through it, and like, as you see how she's described it, if you really, if you follow each of those steps and you document it, you've got as, you've got a nice, clear, someone else can follow it along and know exactly what you did, right? Then you've got that rich descriptive data so they can step in and kind of see what, see what you're doing. So it's similar to uh, Matic analysis, but structured differently. And I think has, so if you're going to go write it up, you've got nice clear steps, right? How many of us have gotten to the end of our case study and been like, wait, how do I describe? I describe thematic analysis. I lived with my data for a year and a half, and then I wrote a story. I just need you to believe it because I am so sick of this part. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like this is a good way. And, and she uses it to complement. She's got some quantitative work too to go along with it, and that's what we're using it. To, we've got the quant stuff, and then also the qualitative stuff. So uh, what I wanted to invite you to do uh, was give this a go. Um, and okay, before I click the next slide, though, I'll tell you why I actually want you to try it. Um, it's not just in case Leo finished on time and we had to go time, but uh, when I was playing with this, I was at a conference, a tech conference in Oklahoma, and um, they handed out copies of our constitution, maybe? I'm not, some government document, you know, and I think I was kind of bored of the session, and they also gave me scissors. I don't even remember what I was just doing, but um, I thought, hey, I'm going to make an iPhone out of the constitution. And so I went through and I cut the I verb, I verb, I verb, I verb out of the Constitution um, and glued them on my little piece of paper and ended up with something so beautiful and insightful. Also, well, it, it's like, well, I see a lot of reasons we're struggling with some things that we are right now in the United States as I put the Constitution in iPhones. But it, it really, it told me a different story about the Constitution than when I would just sit and read it. So uh, that's why I encourage you to go and take a try. Um, you can use some of them here. Our data happen to have it handy. This is also an opportunity for me to be open with the data from my dissertation. Should be de-identified, um, but also it's Emily Finch at K-State and she's okay with her own issues. Uh, so you can scan that if you want. Uh, if you're online, yeah, wherever you are, uh, you're welcome to click into in the Discord. But I really would like for us to take about three minutes and give it a go. And I'm sorry to do it with boring information. Um, I was going to do it with some of our student data that was you know, emotional and stuff like that, but I just think we're all really tired. And so I didn't really want to give you any feelings. So here's my, here's some of the dull dissertation data I had. Take three minutes and play with that or your own data and see what you can build. Maybe we'll do two minutes. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to set my clock for two minutes so we don't just stop because I got work. Well, if you stepped away, I can't remember what it's online. If you stepped away for a second to hold laundry or get your feet on the microwave, um, we're clicking into that link to play with this data and build a little bit of an iPhone to see if it tells a different story than you might get if you were just reading through. Okay. Thank you. Are we on switching on document? You can, or just get out your pencil, or just think about it in your heart. Yeah, yeah, it's that's it's it should be open. I don't know if you can edit it or not. I think I imagine pen and paper, but however you like. And this is just for you. This is it. I'm not gonna like share this out and say, look what we did. Just for it. Got one more minute. She's in enough time. Seconds. 
So you can keep tinkering with it if you want, but isn't that brief and not enough time? Or what did you notice? Did anything stand out to you about that experience, about kind of playing with that a little bit? I found it fun. Yeah. Kind of fun? Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. We'll go with fun. That's not good. You're privileging person's voice as well, like they're in the feelings. Yeah. Yeah. And you see it once you take all those I statements out and you lay them all out. Uh, to me, I was struck by how much richer the story became once I just looked at the I and all the different verbs. And this is just actually, it was just a conversation about their open access and open education publishing program uh, at, at the university. So it's not even, we weren't even saying, how do you feel? How are you? You know, um, and it, it, but it was some of their non some of their sides were interesting to capture as well. And I was originally going to use the UNESCO piece and have us uh, play with that, but there aren't any eyes. In, in the, but it might be interesting. What I think would be cool to do was in some of these annotation of the projects they have, go back and capture those comments and see what kind of eye poems you can make out of those. So, all right, now that you played with it, um, exactly not enough to know anything about it. Um, it's on screen I want, but this is. Thank you very much to these two sponsors. Oh, you can't see that. So, Chan Chan, IMLS, and Logo State. Oh, I know. I said read to the poem. Okay, so she, um, I didn't want to share it with you before because I didn't want to break your ability to build your own stuff. So, um, one list, I'm going to share you the list of, show you the list of I. So, I was, I was, I was, I had, I went, I said. And then she went back and contextualized it, ended up, and this was the poem. I was so angry. I was angry at her, and I was angry at Crystal because I had talked to Crystal about stuff like this. I went in and turned on the light. I said, get out of bed and go buy strawberries. Yeah, she won't be eating my strawberries again. Um, so, right, <laughs> when you just read that poem, you hear a very close story of, a, frankly, Kathy Esler in her house uh, telling the kids to eat the strawberries. But just the fact that she pulled out the I and the, and the verb and just sat with those for a little bit and then decided what to contextualize helped her. So it's, it, it's a story of middle-aged women in the pandemic, right? And it, be, it, it becomes more than just a story about strawberries. It's just that I was, I was, I was, I have, you know, and just that. So those, those feelings makes it, makes it a story. Okay, so uh, these are the organizations that have helped support the research on this particular project. Thank you. And if you haven't found your way to GOGN, I can give you the pitch and bring you on board. Uh, here is the attribution statement. The Kilo Penguins are Brian Mathers. And this is my thank you. Here, thank you. There's my email. Two S's, two L's, all sorts of unnecessary consonants. Uh, and it does not start with an S, right? <laughs> uh, and I'm at, and this one on the board up. And I'm hoping to tune soon. I, I have a Mastodon. I just, until uh, after this conference is when I'll be able to experiment with other things. So, uh, what questions do you have for me to pass on? Should we put it? Okay. Um, something completely distracted me while you were explaining, and I was wondering why, because if you're familiar with, uh, with corpus linguistics methods, the system does that for you in five minutes, and it's all concordances. You, you create a corpus of whatever document, policy, or what you have. Uh -huh. You said, okay, find all the I, I need to, you define for the system to find all the words, um, and then you can um, define how many more words after I, oh, yeah. with what part of speech actually you want to find. So in the middle of your, presentation I just stopped and I'm trying to figure out what this method can do that a corpus cannot do. What and I was thinking it must be probably a human element, but I didn't find any difference and I was wondering why we didn't choose um, a corpus analysis in this Right. And I bet so I'm gonna say I don't know, right? Like we were taught this morning. Um my guess, so this, I'm not familiar enough with this methodology and this method to speak for it. And so go to the go to the article that's cited in there and read about it. But yeah, I, I would guess that it's the human aspect of it, the difference between 
when she describes her work and how much she listened and listened and listened and listened to the transcripts and just lived with it, uh, I would think that might be the difference. Is that she she held hands with her participants and listened to them as she was going on walks and as she built this. Whereas maybe with the corpus, uh, you don't have that. It's maybe a different opportunity to come alongside them. But I don't know because I'm also not familiar with that. Okay. But they they seem to be the same and the, and the yeah it's, it's computational linguistic that can do it in five ten minutes right it and might so be the difference about whether or not it runs through your heart you know and that, yeah yeah for me if I did if, if I if a machine does it for me it probably didn't run through my heart uh my kid who's a computer developer is more likely to run through his heart if he does a computer so it's 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 maybe how you hear the story best yeah. And, and so corpus linguistics is what you're talking about here? Corpus linguistics within the methodology. Justin might be the same thing. Yes. I've actually used poetry as a method of analysis in my PhD. Um, but I can use it from an autism and graphic standpoint. So I was using terminology as my methodology. But because I was being people during the pandemic, it was remote. I used it as one method of kind of reflecting back my findings from. So I wrote couple poems. Uh, one of them was called the Pedagogue Sonnet. It's about the kind of trials of um, higher education. It's kind of based on like Ozzy and Dice, like the rhyming couplets in sonnet form. What a lovely so, gift to bless your participants with. Well, that is so neat. They did quite like it, but I was thinking like that point, you know, you're just like putting the human side into it. So I was putting a wee bit of my own thoughts into it and interpreting it through an IPA methodology and setting it back and saying, how does this sit with you? And I was a bit like your uh, colleague I sort of listened to a few times, but kind of sent it back, they were like, wow. So, it, well, yeah, everyone said, wow, this is amazing. It really, that really explains what I was speaking to about. So oh, that's so neat. And in quality of research, we are the instrument, right? So that's, yeah. yeah. And so that's, maybe just in the direct also graphic, there could be an element for that as maybe. Yeah, that's that's neat. Yeah. And what was the methodology you described? Um, well, it was interpreting with Numerological analysis. Interpretive like the uh, someone who's got a list like myself. No, and I I, I just tire them out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so cool. So Great. and then I use also ethnography as a method within that methodology. Outstanding auto ethnography. Yeah. yeah. So we can wait here, but it has to be great way to analyze your quality of data. If yeah. I get that debunked, so I haven't handled it fully in yet. So oh. someone might say it doesn't no. fit well, but I bet they'll let it. Yeah. Like, Yes, maybe I missed this part, but how did um how did your team become familiar with this methodology? Was she was that something that she just uh, she saw someone else apply, or was it something that was like, part of a course? Um, the reason I'm I'm always kind of curious to know how you know we come up with um, different methodologies that we use. Um, I'm also part of a task force that's thinking about research methods courses. Sorry. No, that's great. <laughs> that's great. So, uh, so the question was, how did my grad student come across this methodology that clearly you should provide to them? Um, and she is a critical feminist scholar, and that's that's her work, and that's 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 her lane. And so she brought it in from other classes, Lou Bailey, and I'm not the advisor on her committee. She's just working for her. I'm just Tanner. Um, so Lou Bailey uh, at Oklahoma State University, who, who does some great work. In gender and women's studies, so that she brought it with her. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm on time, so if I one more time, please. Thank you.